is the story of V-2 number 59, launched at the White Sands Proving Ground on the 20th of May, 1952, by the United States Army Ordnance Corps. This is also the story of the transformation of a tactical weapon to a flying test tube. Although far surpassed by all our latest flying missiles, the V-2 still performs a useful function in gathering scientific information. Knowledge of wind velocity, of radiation intensity, and of the effects of acceleration and radiation on life has been vastly increased by the V-2 flights. Number 59 didn't just happen. Months of coordinated work and planning went into the flight preparation. At the test stand, anchored in the granite Oregon Mountains of New Mexico, the men of the V-2 section of the 96th Ordnance Company accumulated valuable experience by static firing of the rocket. First, through its preliminary stage. Then, the main stage, with its 26 tons of powerful thrust. Electrically controlled carbon vanes in the jet steer the rocket in flight. They become white hot in the 2400 degree flame. From these static firings, the V-2 section continually gain knowledge and skill. Number 59 was the third rocket to be assembled and launched by the V-2 section. In this missile assembly hangar, it reached its final construction stages. Through this aluminum pipe maze, propellants were to be fed to the burner, providing the tons of thrust required by the V-2. The propulsion unit received its final check. Then the tail assembly with its giant fins was carefully rolled into position. Conceived for the sole purpose of destruction, the V-2 was now serving science. More knowledge regarding the composition, density, and temperature of the air at various altitudes was needed. So number 59 was readied for a flight for the upper stratas of the Earth's atmosphere. Since the weights of the individual missiles vary, and because this was a most important factor in determining the height to which it would fly, number 59 went to the scales to be accurately weighed and its center of gravity obtained. Number 59 weighed in at five tons plus before fueling. So an altitude of 80 miles was estimated. After weighing, specially designed equipment gently lowered the rocket onto its erecting trailer for transport to the firing area. Pincer-like clamps firmly gripped the giant missile to hold it in place. In this hangar, less than 11 weeks ago, number 59 was merely a collection of aluminum pipes and sheet metal. Now assembled, except for its warhead, which would be attached to the launching site, the rocket was 42 feet long. One and a half tons of lead had been added to number 59 in order to limit its peak altitude to 80 miles, as well as to give it dart-like stability in flight. The first guided missile battalion carefully transported the rocket on its seven mile journey to the launching site. To prevent internal damage to the missile, the speed of the convoy was limited to 25 miles an hour. At the launching area, hydraulic rams began raising the five-ton missile to its firing position. Once number 59 was firmly in place, the holding clamps were loosened and preparation for firing continued. The crew began the numerous checks and adjustments to assure proper flight alignment of the rocket. Easy access to the missile was provided by the many work platforms of the huge all-purpose gantry crane. Under contract to the Signal Corps, the University of Michigan designed this unusual warhead to take samples at altitudes of 30 to 65 miles on the upward leg of the rocket's flight. 
As a weapon, the warhead of the V-2 used to contain death and destruction. Now, as a test tube, number 59's warhead consisted of vacuum bottles, which would gather air samples of the upper atmosphere. Once the special warhead was in place, the individual bottle assemblies were removed and checked. A missile-borne timer, which controlled the sampling operation, would start upon rocket takeoff, and when the rocket reached the height of 30 miles, flying at a speed of 2,500 miles or more per hour, the timer would open each bottle, allowing it to collect an air sample before closing it and proceeding to the next bottle. When all samples were taken, an electrically triggered charge would eject the canisters from the warhead and release their accompanying parachutes. A small detonator was attached to the retaining ring, which held each canister to the missile. At the proper time, the detonator would fire, severing the band and allowing the container to be ejected. As each container fell earthward, a parachute would unfurl from the canister to slow its descent. The parachute for each bottle assembly was packed in the lower compartment of the canister, directly beneath the sampling bottle. The testing connection and vacuum seal extended through a double bulkhead. The delicate vacuum seal was protected by a heavy brass pipe. With all detonators installed, the crew replaced the assembly in the warhead. The canisters had been painted a brilliant red to aid in their recovery from the desert. During flight, these detonator-operated pistons would break the vacuum seals and allow each sample bottle to fill. When the canisters were in place, the protective nose cone was lowered. This cone would reduce turbulence and prevent the seals on the sample bottles from melting during the flight through the denser lower regions of the atmosphere. When the rocket reached a height of 20 miles and a speed of approximately 3,000 miles per hour, the JATO unit mounted in the nose would automatically fire, expelling the cone from the missile so that the air samples might be obtained. Once the protective nose cone was secure, the warhead installation was complete. Monitoring panels inside the blockhouse enabled scientists to continuously check rocket equipment until the moment of takeoff. In the crisp early hours of firing day, the fueling began. More than four tons of alcohol were pumped into the rocket's fuel tank. The required hydrogen peroxide was next piped aboard the missile. Finally, the rocket's tank received its most volatile propellant, liquid oxygen. Check sheets pasted on the side of the rocket aided in eliminating human errors during this hazardous occupation. The connecting hose grew thick with frost as the liquid oxygen boiled through it at minus 300 degrees. Throughout the fueling period, continuous checks were made for leaks in the propulsion system. With the loading of the five and a half tons of liquid oxygen, which the missile would consume during its 65 seconds of powered flight, fueling was complete. The crew was alerted by the 15-minute warning smoke signal above the blockhouse. Then the gantry crane began moving, and last-minute checks were made. The protecting crane drew back. Then, in the quiet safety of the blockhouse, the firing sequence began. First came the countdown to the preliminary stage. Then the main stage. And flying test tube number 59 took off on what was to be a successful flight and mission. The V-2 is finished as a frontline performer, but through the firing of rockets like number 59, we have gained the information and skill required to build today's more exacting guided missiles.